Thank you for joining us. We're pretty excited to have uh, actually two different types of presentations here uh, from members of Ocean Tastes. And I would first like to introduce Dr. Reza Ovisi. Uh, Reza, go ahead and take the stage. Thank you so much, Alex, for inviting us to have a presentation today. So uh, uh, my name is Reza Ovisi. I am assistant professor at Virginia Tech and I have different hats, you know, so. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I have to change them. So today I will be uh, here as uh, as a co-founder of Ocean Taste and assistant professor uh, at Virginia Tech. And uh, a little bit about my background: I have a bachelor degree in aquaculture engineering, and I've been involved in different types of systems uh, development and reactor uh, development, bioreactor and biofilm development for uh, cleaning the water and removing the pathogenic bacteria from the system. And I have a master's and first PhD in bioprocess engineering, and I got my second PhD in biosystems engineering. And I've been working on alternative proteins, um, so uh, optimization, artificial intelligence application uh, during the last, uh, I would say, 20 years. So. Um, so with that, I would like to start a talking a little bit about my program uh, at Virginia Tech, which is Future Foods Lab and Cellular Agriculture Initiative. Uh, so, and under this program, we are focusing on different types of uh, novel methods for producing food. For example, we do different types of research with aquaponics, and we are using the microbial communities to improve the plant production, animal production, and enhance the water quality and remove the or reduce the uh, antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria uh, from the system. And also we work with different types of microplastics and antibiotic resistance types of research. And so we have been also working with uh, COVID in the food supply chain. And uh, so we were able to improve the nanobubbles technologies for food applications. And I will be talking a little bit about that as well. Uh, we work with different types of alternative proteins, including insects, algae mass, waste stream, uh, different types of insects, edible insects, non-edible insects like uh, black soldier fly. We feed them with different types of waste stream and we try to recover uh, the protein and bioactive components from that them. So we work with different types of bioprocessing methods, fermentation and uh, enzymatic digestion and chemical extraction to develop different types of value added products for different applications, including uh, cellular agriculture. And uh, the main focus that uh, the main research topic that we are focusing at this moment is on cultivated seafood and we are using artificial intelligence and machine learning a uh, lot for um, uh, optimizing the, uh, uh, the uh, cell culture media. And so we got very interesting results and mathematical models, predictive models. And we are in the middle of uh, finalizing the uh, papers and publishing them. And we have been receiving our grants from GFI and USDA, which uh, we should actually acknowledge them. So. Uh, talking about the grants, we have a really large grant, uh, $10 million grant from the USDA, uh, leading by uh, Dr. David Kaplan at Tufts University. We have six different institutions involved in this grant, uh, Tufts, Virginia Tech, UC Davis, uh, Virginia State University, University of Massachusetts, Boston, and MIT. And we are trying to address most of the gaps that we are facing in cellular agriculture. So in our lab, we are focusing on artificial intelligence for media optimization. We are trying to use bioprocessing method for gross factor development. We are involved with uh, plant-based scaffold development. Uh, we are heavily focusing on cell line development from different types of species. And also we work with the course development for undergraduate and graduate students. And also one of the missing part is food safety and uh, GMP for the cellular agriculture that uh, we developed uh, so many fact sheets and uh, the first, I would say, comprehensive review or plan or guidance for food safety plan and GMP. So um, this is some of the examples of our research. We are focusing mainly on different types of protein sources, including like black soldier fly, cricket powders, yeast, mushroom, different types of algae, 
matter in invertebrates and plant sources, including pea. Uh, so we actually use the bioprocessing method and fermentation. We break them down into different, you know, fractions, and we collect the protein part, uh, which mainly includes free amino acids and peptides. And then we apply them for cellular agriculture and cell culture. And we got very interesting results. And I cannot really show the results here because of for the sake of time, but uh, so we will be publishing the results very soon if they are very interesting. And uh, here is the kind of process that we have been using for bioprocessing and digestion and then uh, purifying, I would say, uh, the protein powders or protein uh, fraction from the bioprocessing method. Uh, as you can see here, we have black soldier flies and we also work with crickets, then we digest them, separate them, and here is the protein section that we are looking for. And uh, we dry that and we use it for, um, for uh, cell culture in this case. And uh, we have another project working with insects. We are feeding them with the waste stream and we are using the insects to get rid of the waste and then upcycling them, bringing them back, uh, process them and use them for cellular agriculture. Uh, we have been working with cell line development from oyster, and we have been focusing on different sex, uh, different life stage of the oyster from the larva to adult oyster. We got very interesting results when we were working with oyster and different oyster at different ages. Contamination was, uh, was one of the major issues that we were dealing with, but we, we were able to develop some protocols. Uh, to reduce the contamination problem. And we have been trying different types of, uh, I would say serum and not really from, uh, not bovine serum. So the serum that we made by ourselves in our lab. And uh, this, this uh, project is almost done and we are ready to publish the, the data from this. And this is also related to ocean taste because ocean taste also has been developing so many different cell lines. and. Um, so we have been uh, we have been quite uh, successful with different types of cell line development for ocean taste as well. Um, so again, we are working with different types of insects protein and product development for different applications and um, uh, functional proteins that we are collecting from insects for uh, even insect based uh, burger or combining that with plant based protein or even combining the insects with. Um, with, with the cellular agriculture and use that as a final product because uh, insects, they have quite interesting functional properties. They're totally different from the other animal or plant-based protein. But uh, when I would like to talk a little bit about the problems that we have in this space. So um, uh, this is not the first time uh, that people, they, people tec technically they've been focusing on um, um, the problems uh, associated with the food production or feeding people uh, in the space. But there are many issues that we are facing because of the environment is totally different from uh, what we have here. So for example, uh, making sure that we have the balanced diet for the people in the space or different types of food material that we can provide for them, the stability and, uh, and the shelf life of the product on the space, the, the, the weight of the uh, systems that we are using for producing the food or we are using them for processing the food, they are really important. Uh, performance of the organisms, uh, plants, cells, animals, that's totally different on the space probably compared to the airs. And also making sure that we can develop the microorganisms or making sure that we can develop the, uh, the, the biodiversity or uh, uh, microbiome over there. So in the space, that's another concern. The reason that I'm really uh, concerned and I'm really bringing this up is just because uh, microbial community uh, has, uh, has significant role and critical role for uh, food production. That's why I'm kind of focusing on that as well. And also the waste processing. So what we need to actually make sure that we have an upcycle system for uh, recovering the waste. So temperatures change, gravity, magne uh, magnetic field, and also uh, the environment is different. And because of that, the fluid behavior is totally different. The heat transfer is different. So we need to actually consider all of this when we are talking about 
developing food in the space or uh, producing or processing food in the space. Food safety is another major issue that we are dealing with when we are talking about the space. So there's no hospital over there. So we need to make sure everything is based on the rule. And I will talk, I will be talking about the food safety and technically we will learn more about the HACCP and where it came from. So uh, when we are talking about the cellular agriculture limitation in space, one of the things is providing enough growth factors. That's one of the major concerns. Providing enough growth factors is not very easy over there because either we have to ship them to the space or we need to be able to produce them in the space. But the problem is uh, we need uh, a structure or facility to develop them. Water, we need to have access to enough water to do that. So water become a limiting factor, how we can actually reuse the water that we are using for the media or for the cell culture. Uh, oxygen and the gas transfer. So that's another problem that probably we are facing and we are, it's a limiting factor. Uh, reactor operation, just because of the fluid uh, change and heat transfer, that, that's another concern that we are facing with. And the waste stream uh, and the food safety. So these are all the concerns that we can actually talk about them and see how we can provide some solutions for them. Um, so one of the things that we have been uh, focusing right now and people that are trying to uh, go into this direction is using plants as bioreactors. So instead of having a big facility for producing the bioreactors in the fermenters using the uh, precise fermentation, what if we try to develop the growth factors within the engineered plant material and then we grow the plant because it's much more easier to uh, grow plants compared to microorganisms. And then after that, you don't need that much water for them. So you can extract the uh, growth factors easily from them. You can harvest and milk them, and then you can easily use them to feed your people in the space. Uh, and uh, so these are just plants and they can provide other nut nutrients, including vitamins and minerals for people. Uh, they can remove ammonia from the system, which is one of the major concerns for, for uh, cell culture. So they produce, they metabolize protein and produce, you know, uh, ammonia definitely. So that's the form of the nitrogen that we need to get rid of them. And also they can collect the CO2 and they can generate oxygen as well. And again, so we can use them for different other purposes. When we talk about the plants, we don't have to focus on uh, let's say lettuce uh, or any type of uh, big plants, we can easily focus on macroalgae. So macroalgae is another uh, good uh, example of the plants that we can combine that with this system. And not only we are reducing the waste and recycling the media, but also uh, we are producing the growth factors and so many other byproducts that we can use them in this space. So assume, so we are talking about the growth factor production versus growth factor in the plant. So uh, totally easy. So we can use the plants for as bioreactor and so without any problem. Uh, people also, they started thinking about using other type of bioreactors. For example, insects is a type of bioreactor that we can consider them. They can easily produce growth factors. And uh, so they can, it's easy to grow them. They can remove the solid waste material and they can generate protein and the protein could be used by people in the space. And also insect cells, which is pretty easy compared to other type of cells to produce. Uh, they can also be used engineered to produce uh, growth factors and we can have another type of system in this space to use them along with the cell based uh, meat. Uh, system to produce, uh, to reduce the waste, produce growth factors, and produce more protein for uh, people. Uh, Nanobubbles um, uh, is another type of technologies that we have been focusing and probably there are a lot, there's a lot of, there are a lot of application for this technology. So uh, we have been using nano gas and we have been engineering them for different applications like uh, delivering the materials or delivering the oxygen, improving the performance of uh, microorganisms or plant material. Uh, this is a kind of type of system that we have been dealing with, but right now the, the system is pretty smaller compared to this. And if you see the nanobubble size is 200 nanometer 
a little bit larger than DNA and smaller than a bacteria. And due to their structure, since they are pretty small, they have Brownian motion, they stay in the system for longer time and they can uh, diffuse, uh, they, can, they can diffuse into the organic material and we can easily transfer oxygen to a specific uh, cells if we, we, are, we are trying to feed them with the oxygen. And also we can uh, enhance the delivering of the uh, micronutrients. It's just because we can assemble them into the surface of the nanobubbles. Usually they have negative charge on the surface and we can easily use them for delivering the materials. They are pretty small and they can go everywhere and they stay long time in the system and they have a high amount of energy inside of them as well. Uh, as you can see, compared to the nanobubbles and microbubbles, they are pretty small and uh, they have strong functional properties. So the other concern that we are facing right now is with uh, food safety. And when we talk about food safety, HACCP is the first, uh, first board that comes to our mind, right? So hazard analyzes critical control point and uh, all the food industry that particularly seafood industry, they are familiar with this. Uh, so, for, and it's very interesting because uh, for the first time, uh, HACCP developed for by NASA, NASA for uh, for a space program. And technically, at that time, they were thinking about a food safety problem in the space and how they can protect the astronauts. Uh, from becoming sick because of the foodborne pathogens. And for the first time in 1971, they developed this hazard analysis critical control point, uh, which we are using them a lot uh, right now uh, for food production and all the food processing facilities they are using that. So um, with that, I will take any question, Alex, and uh, after, uh, uh, after at the end of the presentation, but I would like to uh, hand over the presentation to Dr. Peter Nesai, uh, co-founder of the Ocean Taste, and uh, uh, I will be here to answer the question at the end. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Reza, for a great presentation. And uh, thank you, Alex, for inviting me to uh, such an interesting topic for virtual event. So let me let me uh, share my screen. All right. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Peter Nesai, co-founder and CEO at Ocean Taste. Uh, glad to be here for such an interesting event. Uh, so uh, I would like to give a little bit background about myself. So uh, I've got my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, focused on solid design, my master's degree, first master on aerospace engineering uh, in flight dynamics and control. Uh, my second master was in mechanical engineering, more focused on experimental solid design. And uh, finally, I, I've got my PhD uh, in mechanical engineering, focusing on uh, additive manufacturing, 3D bioprinting. So prior to incorporation of Ocean Taste, uh, I have served in different places. Uh, at at Amerikabe University of Technology, I was an R&D engineer and I joined the team to develop uh, flight training devices for, for uh, aviation applications. And this also uh, during my master's degree, first master also, I work on um, specifically on flight vehicle system identification methods. Uh, then I joined MetLab Services at SDSU and uh, I served as a research engineer there. Uh, we, we were a service center to help uh, different local industries such as Nike, 3M, Daktronics and so on and so forth to give them services to provide them you know, cost effective and timely testing solutions. Uh, then I joined WSU uh, at Manufacturing Processes and Machinery Lab. <clears throat> I basically, um, I was working to develop different 3D printing technologies for different application domains, such as uh, variable electronics, biomedical devices, uh, foods uh, and cellular agriculture, and so on and so forth. 
Then I joined a startup company named Smart Wires in renewable energy. Um, and that was a startup company that has already passed their R&D and they were in transition of um, launching their two products for mass production. So uh, I was part of the R&D team for this new product introduction process and development and uh, helping the, the R&D team. After that, I joined uh, Penn State as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, it was a biomedical uh, research lab uh, focusing on uh, tissue engineering and reg regenerative medicine. And uh, mainly I developed, as you can see, a prototype on, on the top uh, right picture, uh, uh, an intraoperative system uh, aspiration assisted. It's called high throughput aspiration assisted by a printer uh, for uh, tissue engineering and composite tissue engineering printing. Um, that was the time that I also, uh, you know, decided to co-found uh, the incorporation named Ocean Taste, uh, where we aim to uh, produce flavor food, nutritious, cult uh, and safe cultivated uh, seafood products. So at Ocean Taste, uh, we're trying to address the global food challenges, uh, both in uh, food supply chain, such as safety and uh, <clears throat> sustainability. Besides the, in addition to those problems, we also try to address the current issues with cultivated meat industries. Uh, specifically, we're trying to reduce the cost of the cell culture media. We are trying to address the cell, vi cell line viability and uh, cell line development uh, cost. And also we're targeting to reduce the cost of the uh, uh, texturing and scaffolding. At Ocean Taste, we aim to produce cell-based seafood using our uh, proprietary technologies in seafood cell line isolation, serum-free media, and plant-based scaffolds. We do this using our uh, patent-protected technologies in uh, artificial intelligence for screening and uh, discovering serum-free media, our cost-effective plant-based media, and our process technologies for combining cells uh, with plant-based scaffolds, uh, along with our expertise in fermentation and bioprocessing, we have developed several uh, cell lines from different sea species, such as uh, Eastern Oyster, American Eel, Florida Pompano, and Japanese uh, Fugo. What makes us uh, unique or what differentiates us from other companies is actually our blended approach. Um, using our um, um, cell-based and plant-based uh, approach, and also uh, um, developing our AI-driven cost-effective media with our cost-effective plant-based scaffolds. We have actually unique uh, relationship and access to different facilities at, in two different uh, universities, Virginia Tech and UC Davis. We have established strong partnership and mentorship from uh, different, uh, you know, industries within the in, in, in uh, cell and food uh, market. We also ha have a strong uh, networks and access to industrial scale uh, facilities. So, of course, I'm not alone in this journey. Uh, with me, I have Rizzo Vasey from Virginia Tech and uh, Dr. Niti Meeting uh, from UC Davis. So cellular agriculture application in space, is, of course, is one of one of the very uh, interesting subject for me uh, and for Ocean Taste uh, due to many reasons from my, my backgrounds in aerospace engineering and our, my current work in cellular agriculture. So uh, this is a reason that uh, I would like to talk about it. So uh, the uh, statistics that NASA uh, in 2020, uh, you know, published about uh, the number of scientific experiments that has been done in International Space uh, uh, st uh, Station showed that there are multiple, multiple aspects like biology and biotechnology, as well as the technology development are more than 3000 scientific experiments that have been done in this space. Generally, if we wanna talk about the cellular agriculture, uh, application, we have to think about two, two different um, application domains. One, 
for commercial space applications, uh, it can be space tourism or international space station, as also as well as the long term space discoveries uh, for manned crewed space flight or long space voyages. And depending on each, each, each one of them, you know, uh, uh, exploration will be different. So currently, there are 11 astronauts in IS. I say that as we as we speak, and uh, this is actually a nice uh, picture of uh, a fresh veggie uh, grown on ISA. But what what is important is uh, is actually besides the prepared food, as well as the uh, you know uh, desserts, uh, they need to have access to fresh meat or or better say uh, alternative ways you know to produce meats where. Uh, recently, I, I think a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, Axiom, SpaceX, and as well as the uh, Aleph Farms, they, they announced to test for the first time cultivated meats uh, in space. They wanted to explore the, uh, to get a better understanding about the platform, uh, cultivation platform uh, in such an extreme environment. So this will require to to run, you know, to do some preliminary designs for cultivated um, uh, meat on long space voyages. And to, to, to be able to do that, they, uh, they actually send um, cells to space. They're using a microfluidic uh, devices called uh, lab on a chip. And this will help actually to, uh, to get a better understanding about the, uh, you know, behavior of cell, cell culture in uh, microgravity environments. And they were trying to establish an automated closed loop system um, in order to bring down the portion of resources to raise the whole animal for meat. And this, this will require to assess different, you know, various means of protein productions. And hopefully these, uh, these exploration will help to establish a transferable process which we can use to increase efficiencies of mainstream pro production on, on our Earth. So when we talk about uh, space application, one, one important factor, um, one of the most important factor is actually talking about uh, microgravity uh, research and manufacturing, to think about or talk about the microgravity as a platform, because uh, the reason for the reason for that is um, zero gravity actually creates unique millions of opportunities and possibilities uh, because of the uh, weightlessness that of objects and this will um, produce a phenom physical phenomenon several physical phenomena that we talk about here and this will definitely affect the uh, cell growth cell uh, uh, culture uh, uh, proliferation, cell, cell differentiation, and, and so on and so forth. As an example, for example, absence of sediment, uh, sedimentation uh, will, will uh, before, before jumping to that one, actually, I wanted to show a picture on, on your left. You, you'll see a protein crystallization in space, which shows the, uh, how pr pr protein crystals uh, grow larger you know in microgravity environments this will uh, ended up with fewer defects yielding higher quality crystals and uh, this is different than uh, what they have been seeing you know these crystals uh, for diffraction and then uh, their earth bound uh, counterparts so these these this this is due to the uh, physical phenomena that that will happening one of them as i mentioned is uh, the, the absence of uh, uh, sediment, uh, and that will make it to materials uh, to uh, actually not, not settle down uh, easily. And also the, uh, the absence of buoyant, buoyant forces uh, also eliminates the convection currents, uh, which, which uh, directly uh, affects the uh, fluids uh, in, in a space. And uh, this is, uh, this, uh, Convection uh, fluid is due to the temperature gra gradient and density differentiation. Uh, one of the other things that uh, counter container less processing, and this is actually means uh, 
uh, means that there is no we can we can materials can can levitate you know in a space and this is actually a great example of uh, one of the current uh, active uh, projects in uh, on earth that is uh, 3d printing in space with, which helps that for example how we can use this this property physical properties for um, uh, making uh, 3d bioprinters that that can use this levitation um, property, natural levitation property for, for printing cells and cell fruits. The other is absolutely because of the lack of gravity, there is no directionality, so there is no up and down. And uh, of course, due to the lack of hydrostatic pressure, uh, we uh, the effects of uh, surface tension becomes more dominant. Uh, compared, uh, you know, to uh, the same phenomenon, physical phenomenon on, on, on Earth, and of course, uh, we um, the the shear stress shear stress is also significantly the effects are reduced, and this will cause, you know, the surface tension and diffusion to be, become more dominant. So, in general or in overall, um, the microgravity environments. Uh, has has a tremendous effects, uh, as you can see, because of the weightlessness of objects in in space, will produce uh, multiple or numerous you know effects on uh, cell growth in and cell culture media uh, for space exploration, and this will open space tourism opportunities uh, for um, you know uh, in order to make sure on on, on the commercial scale. Uh, we have uh, opened these doors. We have to consider all these factors, uh, and and of course, uh, what what matters is for the next generation product designers. So they need to uh, they 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 need to think about uh, um, uh, creating products that are um, self heal. They they are uh, they can be they 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 can be self repair and they can they can produce themselves, they can make themselves. What does that mean is, is actually, uh, it will help a lot in terms of uh, technology development there. And this will create potential rooms for uh, alternative methods to produce meat from cell, cell cultures. And this, this actually, uh, as a cell-based uh, company um, and startup uh, at Ocean Taste is also, we're trying to uh, you know, address these Hopefully, these challenges, you know, uh, for producing the cell based seafood in cell uh, 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 space and uh, in future. And that's, that's all I, I have for my presentation. And I'm open for QA. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for your attention, guys. Well, thank you very much, uh, Reza and Peter. That was definitely very interesting and, and also kind of. Um, uh, you know, allowed me to kind of come up with a wide array of questions. And so, um, you know, to, to get started, I, I have a question that's kind of directed to, to both of you. Uh, and that's regarding kind of communicating research and, and protocols, uh, especially because as we are kind of uh, new applications or research is being done in space, oftentimes, um, you know, the researchers themselves or the core researchers themselves will not be taking out, you know, this, this research. They're going to be um, relaying this information to the astronauts that are going to be conducting the research in space. And so my question is really about, you know, communicating research and, and protocols. Um, oftentimes you won't be able to spend too much time with the astronauts uh, because they're going to have a lot of other research, preparation, etc. So I guess, do you have any general kind of thoughts on you know, what has been the most effective way to communicate research and, and protocols, uh, especially as we're thinking about this type of application in space? And I know it's kind of a, of a broad question, but uh, any thoughts on that and, and or kind of tips or tricks or anything like that, just generally speaking? Uh, I can start answering that based on my experience with publication. So, so Alex, this is a really great point. So publication and communication, right? And most of the time, let me start with this. Most of the time, so when we when we try to publish our data, um, so 
it's very deep in science and sometimes we just want to publish it and we don't want to we don't really care about open access when we say open access we have different types of journals so you publish them and not many people actually have access to them and if you want to make it open access the author at least they or the authorship they need to pay for that right so but uh for 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 some topics i think this is in very important that as others so we we take this responsibility and make sure that everyone all around the world they have access to that for example i'm working right now on a food safety plan and gmp uh for cellular agriculture and I've been working with so many people and so from industry, great people from different, you know, uh, type of industry and stakeholders. And they provided so many great comments for me. And right now, what I'm trying to do is I'm just going to make it uh, available for everyone. I'm going to pay to cover the cost of publication. And I think this is my responsibility to contribute to science. And I owe these to people. To society, I, I I look at myself like that. So I need to make it available for everyone. If it can help someone, that would be the goal. So that's one thing. The other thing is, um, so based on my experience working with NASA, uh, there are there are uh, incubators that working with NASA. It's very hard sometimes to get involved with NASA research. And so they are really busy with so many different things. But there are my experience showed that. So I I can I I was I was able to approach a startup companies that spin up from NASA. And I was able to communicate with them because most of those people they came from NASA and they were able to connect me to 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 the uh, to the space team or they were able to communicate with the space team, with my data, with my research. That helped a lot. So I didn't have to approach them by myself. So I approached the incubators and the startup companies, and they were able to communicate on behalf of me. That was very helpful for me. Uh, so there are other you know, opportunities. There are other research centers uh, developing some probably. Um, so. Um, uh, proposals together with some of these researchers that might be another way to communicate a podcast like what you do and sharing that with everyone that that's an amazing um, topic and that's an amazing uh, method for communication uh, and again so I believe in free communication and making sure that everyone has access to 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 information that that's my uh, approach actually yeah Great, thank you. Peter, anything to add on, on that? Yeah, no? actually, this is this is a great question. And actually, I, I'll, I'll talk it based on my personal experience. So I'm coming from a different background. So to, from 3D bioprinting space, biotech, coming to food tech. And you can imagine one of the uh, ways that connect me very, very well with this space was absolutely accessing to the open source, uh, you know, information. What happens is actually there are there are nonprofit organizations out there, uh, such as GFI and so on and so forth. And these organizations with, with close collaborations with, with university researchers, they, they provide a platform that is open source with information that, that spe specifically because of the cellular agriculture is pretty, and uh, I would say still immature. And needs to. There are a lot of things that need challenges that need to be to be addressed. And this this open concept format and platform makes it possible, you know, for everyone to to communicate. And I believe, and I believe, uh, like what Reza, I'm just you know kind of intensify what what Reza said is actually podcasts and you know live live stream uh, events in, in inviting people from from the NAS, from the space side, I would say, uh, this will create these this channels between them. And uh, definitely maybe for, for someone or some startups like us will be difficult, you know, to, to reach out to, you know, uh, uh, space organization directly, but then, then through these incubator programs that, that Reza mentioned or through these you know, uh, virtual events, you know, if when you when we see people from from the space sites coming to the to to these platforms and, you know, communicate with us closely, this will create this this, you know, uh, part of 
I would say, transferable knowledge, you know, among us, what we learn from them, you know, from their experience up in space and what we do here. So this, this will probably uh, help to put these missing puzzles together, you know, to, to help these two moving go forward, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And if, there, if there's anything that we're starting to realize is that what's happening in space definitely benefits what's happening here on Earth. What's happening on Earth actually benefits what's, what's going on uh, in space. Now, my next question is, is related to, um, is, is directed towards uh, Reza. And so uh, you mentioned something very interesting about, you know, the need of oxygen if you're, you know, putting together a bioreactor. And, you know, oxygen is something that you, you kind of have a limited resource of if you're doing any research in space. So that was just an interesting point. But um, I want to kind of move on to what you said about plants. Um, and so kind of different types of plant research, I think using kind of plants as bioreactor, I think that's like a super cool topic that I'd, I'd love to get into more on, on kind of a different conversation. But you mentioned that plants would need like less water than a typical protein production system or kind of bioreactor system. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, to me, it seems like plants actually need a lot of water, but I guess if you're talking about, you know, just kind of small type of drip irrigation over a couple, you know, months, um, versus, you know, maybe, you know, liters of water that you might need for a bioreactor system, um, would you say that, you know, plants would need less water or, or, uh, would it, you know, what kind of comments do you have on that? Absolutely, yes. Uh, first of all, so we don't have to, so, to, so what, what is happening right now, for example, right now uh, in, on the earth, we have vertical farmings, uh, which is uh, uh, blooming right now. And uh, I have been, that's one part of my, that's one of the topics of my research. Um, so I focus on uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, and aeroponics. So, and these are different in terms of the water that you are providing for the plants. And even, even if in the hydroponics, when you provide the water, so the water is just circulating and it's just a, bar, a carrier or vector for the food material. It just develops, uh, you just have that water, it just carries the water, uh, uh, carries the nutrients to the plants. But there is another technology is called aero, uh, 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 aeroponic which means you just spray and mist a little bit of moisture with high amounts of nutrients. And then as long as you keep them moist, that's enough. So then technically your water I think uh, Reza froze on my end, but maybe he'll come back in a second. application even compared to the hydroponics it is 99 percent so can, can you hear me can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you now uh, I'm, I'm sorry so can, can you hear me right now yeah uh, sorry so um i think you cut off right around aquaponics so maybe you could uh or sorry aeroponics so maybe yes. um if you could kind of start with aeroponics sure so when we when, so, sorry about that so when we talk about aeroponics uh, that's another type of plant production right now and you can produce tomato different types of plant material for feeding people lettuce many things and all you need to do is you just need to spray a little bit of water containing high amounts of nutrients to the roots of the plants and that's it so as long as you keep them moist then you provide the nutrients and enough uh, uh, enough uh, 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 gas for or oxygen for them, and that's uh, that's all they need. So, and then you can reduce the water application compared even to the hydroponics, ninety nine percent. So, all water that you need is just one percent of the regular hydroponics production or regular agriculture. So, you don't need that much water. So, uh, I think the best option for that is going to be aeroponics. Then you have the roots in the air, you spray a little bit of water once in a while, and that's it. Wow, yeah. And I guess if you think about hydroponics, like, um, you know, in a zero gravity situation, you're going to have to control kind of that flow pretty closely. Yes. So that is very interesting. So, okay, right. awesome. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And that's super interesting. You know, my next question is directed towards Peter. Um, and, you know, you were, you were talking about how a lot of the, the research in space is typically happening on, you know, these lab on a chip systems. Um, and, you know, we hear about this a lot, mostly in applications of kind of space or, or different type of very specific applications. I just have a kind of more of a general question and, and, and Reza, maybe you could fill in on this as well. 
Um, is there a lot of kind of non lab on a chip specific research that is happening on you know this, these lab on a chip systems? And, and I guess what I mean by that is, you know, lab on a chip, a pretty common tool that's used in other type of research, or is it more of a specific thing that people are doing for very specific applications at this time? But that, that's a that's a very great question, actually. So what probably what one of in, in my opinion, one of the reasons that lab on a chip becomes pretty, pretty interesting topic, you know, especially in biotech space, is is the fact that is not only uh, so you have in a very small uh, you know uh, device, I would say microfluidic device, you have access to monitor. Uh, the, let's say several phenomena. Uh, if it's a cancer treatment, you know, study, or if it's the cell growth study in a rich, rich media, or so on. The reason that it's more interesting is actually the fact that you can, you know, communicate, transfer the data, you know, using this chip, transfer data, get the information, monitor, and then send it. Uh, do do it uh, as an online platform. So this will, this will make it easier you know uh, uh, you know compared to having a big platform um, let's say a huge platform of um, the same the same study and then you're trying to probably monitor the growth so you take a small sample you studied it and then uh, you you constantly you know communicate it and this will make it easier to to have a better control you know on on uh, on things but uh, yes, of course, this is not the only way. This is not the only way of, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, research, especially uh, when it comes to cell culture, because we are talking about uh, a larger scale. So I, what I believe is what, what's happening probably in uh, near future is, is what I call it, uh, creating a, a printers, 3D, 3D bioprinters that they, they can uh, they can make themselves, they can self, as I said, self-heal, self-repel, and self-test uh, themselves. So this will, this will make it easier for them, you know, to uh, in a larger scale instead of, instead of a smaller scale. You can, you can study the same fact, you know, constantly and through, through the uh, development that has been done in IoT. And that, this, is, this is what I think uh, the next generation of technologies will happening, you know, uh, besides the lab on the chip. I don't know if I can, uh, I could answer your question, but but that's that's you know one one aspect that I can think of. No, absolutely, Reza. Do you guys use lab on a chip? Uh, not at this moment in my previous lab. We we used to work with lab on a chips, and uh, so for for pathogenic bacteria detection. At that time, we wanted to develop some uh, for for like um, uh, Listeria and E. coli detection, and also what we did was we created um, we have a patent around that, so we created a kind of um, uh, edible uh, uh, non living edible uh, surrogate, uh, and so we we were able to use that for process that verification and validation. So. Um, uh, for 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 food safety application, we use that. Yeah, yeah. In, I I think to add on one one thing about lab on a chip is actually the, to my understanding is more more useful for uh, detection phase or let's say exploration, but not not really a, a great platform. I would say for uh, the actual actual uh, let's say uh, optimization or let's say actual the discovery. But for the first for the first very first step, in, in order to quickly understand what's going on, you know, um, let's say the effect of uh, gravity, lack of gravity on on, on cell growth in, within the media, yeah, it, it can help you for a rapid rapid test exploration. But it does not help you for for the next step, which is which is how we can establish a closed loop system so that you know we can we can grow cells within the media. We can we can do. Uh, you know, in, in a larger scale. I would say it's a pre-diagnostic uh, tool uh, at this step. I see, okay, cool. Thank, thank you for those answers. I think, you know, the last question I have really just to kind of close us off is that, you know, of the 
within the cellular agriculture industry and, and cultivated meat and, and seafood industry, you know, fish is a, is a fish seafood is a smaller part of that kind of you know overall market, right? And and I guess if you were to calculate the market, I would say you know the number of startups working on these, right? So fish is a smaller segment, which makes sense because we have you know you know beef, chicken, all these other types of of proteins. Um, but when we're looking at space. We actually see that there's been quite a bit of research done on, you know, fish in space, um, and and almost, you know, one to one. So, you know, and and this dates back to some of the early NASA research with the goldfish, and you know, Finless Foods having something, and and I guess, you know, why do you think that is um, that fish is actually kind of, um, you know, there there are so many fish experiments in space. Uh, I can I can start with that and uh, Peter, if you want to, can please uh, please join me. So, uh, well, most of the research around toxicity, environmental toxicity, and the problems that we had, antibiotic resistance uh, issues and uh, pollutions, uh, many things like that, they they are all really related to the cell lines from the fish. And so, for example, even if you go back and see what type of organisms that we have been working with, it's zebrafish. So all the uh, medical facilities, they have an aquaculture part so that they're just focusing on the husbandries and keeping this, this uh, uh, zebrafish alive, right? So that's why one of the major, um, one of the major uh, topics for focus on is just the cells, cell lines from the seafood species because it's pretty easy to access, it's pretty easy to keep them, uh, keeping the uh, organisms and having access to the original organism is pretty easy, but if you want to go back and work with the live, you know, big cow, it's very hard to deal with. So, but having access to the kind of a small fish, they are pretty small, keeping them is pretty inexpensive. Feeding them is pretty easy. They don't generate that much waste. They don't generate that kind of off flavor into the system. Uh, and um, most of the research with LC50 toxicity, they are all go back to the fish. They, they are very easy to handle. They are pretty easy to work with. That's one of the major reasons that we are seeing that uh, right now, even in this space, people they're focusing. Yeah, and to add that, I, I believe, Probably the simple answer is the diversity. Actually, we, when we talk about you know cows uh, or let's say poultry, so there are a limited number of you know animals that can be studied. But when we talk about the sea world, there are more than hundred species that that can be eaten by human beings. So these diversities uh, gives um, a lot of freedom to uh, researchers, you know, to explore and you know study different different aspects. So which we don't have it. And as, as Reza says, size, size and cost, I think matters when, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, limited resources in space. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, the, you know, the contact information uh, will be posted below if you have any additional questions, but otherwise we'll close off this session. Thank you both so much. Thank, thank you, you so much, Alex. Much, Alex, it was really nice talking to you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.